Joint Water Commission is partners between the City of Hillsborough, which is the managing agency. So they are, you know, our paychecks and HR resources and all that good stuff comes from the City of Hillsborough. But partners are Tualatin Valley Water District, the City of Beaverton, and the City of Forest Grove. Um, we serve over 365,000 customers. I think it's really pushing up right into the 400,000 number these days. And so um, all of kind of Washington County, we always say uh, out into Highway 217 West, but the lines are kind of fuzzy in that, so it goes through there. Um, well, there you can actually see the kind of the, the area that we're supplying. Um, currently, we are the largest conventional water treatment plant in the state of Oregon. I assume we will lose that uh, <laughs> title when, when Portland gets their water plant up and running, but uh, uh, we're rated by the state currently at 75 million gallons a day, although with the current expansion that we're wrapping up, we're, we're increasing by 10 million gallons, so we will be at 85 million gallons a day once, once we're uh, um, approved by the state for that. So I know um, one of the questions you guys are looking for was how much, you know, this is about 62 acres that we're, we sit on here. Um, and we have a lot of uh, solids drying beds, which um, you can kind of see the pictures of them up here, and, and we have lots of drying beds. So um, I know that's not going to be a, sounds like a part of the Portland process. So, um, but that takes up a lot of, a lot of land for us. So uh, we do run 24-7, um, 365, where someone's here all the time, day and night. Um, kind of see, I know there was, there was another question. I know you guys wanted to know what the lighting would look like. This plant was originally constructed in the 70s. The 7, 1976 is when it came online. And, uh, you know, back then, I think lighting probably wasn't thought of in the way it is now. So a lot of the older light, which we have retrofitted a lot of them throughout the years, but uh, you can kind of see what the, the plant puts off. Um, all the new expansions is, is very um, focused on downward lighting. You know, um, everything is projected down so that we're not uh, lighting up the night sky. So, um, yeah. That, that picture is from up at our Fern Hill Reservoirs looking down at the treatment plant, but pretty cool. We hadn't really taken pictures of the plant at night before, so coming in for you guys' presentation, we, we thought that was kind of cool, so, all right. Um, we get water here from the Tualatin River is our primary source. Um, during the summer when our demands are high, the Tualatin River cannot keep up with our demands, so we release water from Barney Reservoir and Hag Lake. Um, Barney Reservoir is owned by the Barney Reservoir Ownership Commission, which is again all those partners I mentioned before, plus Clean Water Services. Um, and Hag Lake is owned by the Bureau of Reclamation uh, and managed and operated by the Tualatin Valley Irrigation District. But we release water, um, so every on a daily basis pretty much um, during the summer we're releasing water and calculating how much we need. and releasing that into the Tualatin River where we pull it out from our intake down below. So. Um, this is looking at our intake that's on the Tualatin. Um, we have four variable speed drives down there, variable frequency, so we can turn them up and down, um, regulate the flow. Just as part of our expansion, we have brand new pumps down there, 400 horsepower motors, um, and uh, yeah, can pump up about I think our goal was 88 to 90 million gallons a day because we will lose some of that water within the process as, as it goes through the treatment process and we want to be able to pump out 85 so we have to bring in a little bit more than that. So, <clears throat> um, Looking at the treatment plant itself, kind of high level stuff, the raw water pipelines come in. We are in this building right here. Um, attached to it is our flash mix where we add alum, we add chlorine, and we have the ability to add powder activated carbon for taste and odors or an uh, cyanotoxins. Um, and we add, I'm missing something there, caustic. Uh, we have the ability to add uh, sodium hydroxide to help bring up the pH. Um, for times during winter storms when there's a lot of rain, it'll dr tend to drive the pH down. Our alum doesn't work quite as well during those times, so we add caustic to add alkalinity, add pH, bring that back up and help our chemicals do their job. Um, recently we have added actually uh, the ability to add a, um, another polymer, a flocculent aid, a acetylene aid, something that helps the alum create the coagulant, the, the flocculant and help it settle in uh, our sedimentation basin. So 
from the rapid mix, the, we have seven sedimentation basins. And uh, again, you know, this plant is kind of a history, uh, archaeological dig if, if we got into it. These first two said basins were constructed in, in the 70s. And then again in the 80s, we built another one that matched those two. And then in the 90s, they decided that they didn't like those ones anymore and we needed to expand and we built these longer, um, thinner ones, which have actually, they work, they do tend to work a lot better than these ones for us. Um, and then as part of um, the expansion, we've added plate settlers in them and uh, increased the capacity again. So it's kind of, we keep, just keep adding on to the, adding on to the plant and um, yeah, I guess that's it for there. So it goes through the sedimentation. We have, yeah, yeah, it, the coagulation, we have big paddle mixers that are going to mix, create the flock. The flock moves into the settling part of it where it's heavy enough to settle out onto the, into, you know, onto the floor of the basins. The clean water comes out the end of the basins and moves over to the filters. Um, <clears throat> next, uh, we now have 16 filters, dual media. We have anthracite and sand. Um, these filters, again, the first, you know, so many were built with the first expansion. We've added on and added on. And now as part of this current expansion, we've added 15 and 16 down here and they're actually twice the size of our previous filters and um, <laughs> a lot of the you know again back to the way things used to always be or whatever but a lot of our current plant the previous plant is not very seismically fit so like during a major earthquake we wouldn't expect a lot of it to to make it so all of the new stuff that we're putting in is um, is seismically fit and is put on auger cast piles so that's why we started instead of adding on to these this current filter structure which is not on auger cast piles we started a new new structure out here that from now on when we build we'll go this way with it and and you know have a um, a robust line a way for water to get through the treatment plant um, as we build so we also all the new piping that we added is called ERDIP piping, earthquake resistant ductile iron pipe, so that it has the ability to kind of bend and flex um, and move with the earthquake. Because we are in a very wet area around here, and um, what is it, 20, 21, inches. 21 inches potentially of settlement after an earthquake out here. So we have to be able to be a little uh, flexible. So um, from the filters, oops, sorry, Jeff, go back real quick. From the filters, the water enters what we call the clear well. The clear well is where we get our contact time, disinfection. We, we do have gas chlorine here on site. Um, we are looking to go away from gas chlorine. And, um, but uh, so we do use gas chlorine. It goes into the clear well. We have about a million gallons. I think it's 1.2 million gallons of the clear well, where it then goes into uh, pumps. We have two diff different pump stations. Pump station one, again, the older facility. Pump station two was added in the 90s. So they both pull from this clear well and pump out into the distribution system. Um, it's kind of a look at our pumps. In pump station one, we have anywhere from a 400 to a um, 800 horsepower motors. And then in pump station two, we have 1,000 horsepower motors that uh, they'll pump 9,000 gallons a minute into the system. So. Um, and then a whole mess of pipelines that head out into the system, whether it's out to the north transmission line that feeds kind of the north side of Hillsboro out along Highway 26 to Intel and all the industrial kind of customers out there. And then we have a, one a line to Forest Grove. We have a, lines, a couple lines up to our Fern Hill Reservoirs that sit up on the hill up here. Uh, we have two 20 million gallon tanks that sit up there and then they feed what we call the south transmission line down to the southern sub part of Hillsboro all the way out to Beaverton. So um, <clears throat> there's a nice shot of the, of the reservoirs. You can see the treatment plant sitting down there. The reservoirs here, the pipelines come through the trees right there and then feed out the backside of the, of the tanks. So we're actually draining one of those tanks right now for some repairs on the roof. So that's kind of a, it's not something that we do quite regularly. 20 million gallons is a lot to get rid of. So. Um, the sludge, the solids that get removed out of the sedimentation basins. Um, again, we use these drying beds. And so we have a chain and flight system that's inside of the drying beds that will scrape that sludge as it settles out. And then it sends it out to these ponds where we, where, um, we rotate through the different drying beds. We let the sludge dry. It's really kind of 
crazy stuff. It looks like you're walking on the moon or something. Is you know once it's dried up, it's uh, and then we have uh, contractors come in and they they haul it out and they, they take it to the waste management. Um, um, it's because there's really not our our sludge isn't you know there's aluminum and, and dirt from the river, so it's not like a wastewater where there's a lot of useful solids in there. But the the landfill is able to use it for for fill dirt and stuff like that. So. Um, yeah, so it's pretty much a summertime drying process. So we have we have enough drying beds to kind of rotate through them, and then we'll usually have we have some sort of a system where you know we'll have like these two ponds will be full, and then going into the summer, those are the ones that we pretty much don't use them for the summer, and um, we'll just let them dry, and then at the end of summer we we'll have them hauled out, and so they'd be nice and clean, and then the next summer it'd be a different two or something. So just kind of rotates around through there, and we doesn't really reabsorb water so we can we have one drain if it's sent all summer drying out we can let it go over the winter and it doesn't really absorb all that rainwater so it doesn't get really wet again it kind of just runs off of it so. yeah yeah it is some weird stuff but um chemicals that we use here at the treatment plant we do use aluminum sulfate or alum for our main coagulant um polymer we have a filter aid polymer which is fed just ahead of the filters. So it helps any particles that might get there. It helps the media. It helps those particles stick to the media so that um, as it gets, you know, gets filtered out. Chlorine we add for disinfection, but also for, you know, to make sure that the water is safe to drink by the time it gets to the taps. Um, we need, you know, it's required for like a 0 0.2 milligrams per liter at the f furthest point of the distribution system. So. Typically, our uh, residual leaving the treatment plant is a 1.0 to a 1.3 um, around that area as we pump it out. Um, sodium hydroxide, caustic, um, corrosion control. But it, so we, we our target pH leaving the treatment plant is currently a 7.7. .7. That might be changing, adjusting as the Willamette treatment plant water. Uh, Willamette water supply system is a new treatment plant that's going to be kind of tied in to the other end of our system so we may increase our pH to kind of help match that but that hasn't really fully been worked out yet. And then a powder activated carbon for taste and odors and algal toxins. So um, those are the chemicals that we have here. Um, Could you go back for a second? Yep. When you use the term polymer, I think plastic and byproduct of the oil industry. Is that correct? That's a great question. Um, plastic, probably yes, to some degree. Um, they are NSF approved chemicals. These, you know, we're using stuff that is. Um, so, uh, we are feeding such a small dosage of it that uh, I mean, none of this is going to make it through our filters. But I don't know about the oil part, whether that's so, I, I don't true. know exactly 100% sure. The, the filtrate polymer is a polyacrylamide. Um, I'm not sure about that. I do know that our coagulant and flocculant aid polymer <coughs> is hydrocarbon based. It does have a uh, hydrocarbon uh, solution in it. But like Chris said, it is, it is NSF, which is the National Sanitary Foundation. Uh, anything that gets put into water has to be certified. And it's very strictly regulated <coughs> to the quantities of how much can go in. And like Chris said, we're way below any of yeah. uh, those allowable limits. That is uh, the polymer feed rate and stuff is something we have to report to the state on what we're using and how much or what our max dose was and those types of things on an annual basis as well. So, um, yeah. So before you continue also, mm -hmm. so <laughs> from the time a water molecule enters the intake, yep. how long is it until it leaves? Well, there's a lot of it depends on that question. Um, depends on how much water we're making because we currently today we're probably making 30 million gallons a day. But during the summer, you know, we could be anywhere from 60 to 70. So um, the, fast, the more water you're making, the faster it's going to be to get through here. We have seven of those sedimentation basins. It would depend on how much, how many of those we have online because the more we have online, the slower it's going to go. But I would say that at the fastest, it could probably be three and a half hours before it's through the treatment plant and probably on the slowest it could be you know goodness a day or so you know if, if we were only running a couple of basins at a really low flow it would be it'd be it could take a while um, ballpark numbers but yeah, yeah. <clears throat> 
deliveries, um, we usually get, yeah, well, I guess these are pictures of our chlorine tank delivery and alum. Um, we get alum about t two loads a week, two trucks to fill. We have three alum tanks, and um, we go pretty much about once a week, we'll get a delivery of two trucks. Um, polymer, that's a much different story. You know, we get about an 18 bag pallet shows up, and you know, every six months or so, um, it's a pretty infrequent delivery. Chlorine, we get about once a week. Um, maybe in the winter, it stretches out to two weeks, but anymore, our winter demands are, are climbing as well. Um, people are different partners that have ASRs, the aquifer, aquifer storage and recovery, so they're filling their ASRs during the winter. So our, our winter demand is starting to climb to where we don't have the big drop off we used to see. Um, caustic soda, we get about once a week in the summer, and again, it can stretch out to every two weeks in the winter, but once a week is a pretty fair statement for sure. Powder activated carbons, those get delivered in these super sacks. You can see a super sack, um, and we don't feed carbon very often. In fact, it's, it's very rare that we do feed carbon. I think the last time we fed it was in 2008, and be prior to that, it was 20 years, I think, previously, so it's only when something goes wrong in the upper in the system above us and we get like you know taste and odors or um, or algal toxins so um, so yeah so we're not getting deliveries of those very often um, deliveries, well, does that mean, um, just one truck? typically it's one truck yep the chlorine will be on one truck um, the alum would be the only exception to where to fill a tank it will take two trucks so um, yeah I just wanted to say this plant is a little more than 50 percent of the capacity of the Triple Run plant, and this water is a little more challenging to treat, so it might take a little bit more than the plant. But if you double those numbers of trucks put up there, that's probably a conservative estimate for the number of truck chemical deliveries that you might see at the moment. Yeah. I know yeah. That's a question we asked. Yeah. No. Yeah. So, Chris, when you get these canisters of chlorine, chlorine is a fairly dangerous. Yes, chemical absolutely. In, in concentration. What happens to that? Does it go into like a containment area and, you know, like a double wall protection or what is the process? Yep. So, great question. Leads right into um, we have quite the process for the chlorine. Chlorine is a very hazardous chemical for us, and, and that is one of the major reasons that we would like to not have chlorine any longer and go to a bulk hypo or something like that. But so we have what we call the process safety management, um, which is where, I mean, we have sensors down there. We have a scrubber you can see in case there was ever a leak. Um, it's going to be captured in here in a caustic solution, run through a caustic solution and then neutralized. Um, but so we have nine cylinders, nine one ton cylinders here on site. And typically a delivery will bring in three at a time. So we have six of them will be connected and we'll be using three of those and three of them will be on standby. So when the first three run empty, the other three, <clears throat> excuse me, the other three will kick on. And then the three that, that are not connected are either empty waiting to be picked up or full that had just been dropped off. So, um, so we will take, you know, operators have, we're, we're uh, respirator fitted and, and we, we have, you know, all these safety procedures in place to where you know we unload the tanks set them there and typically we like to let them sit for at least a day while because you know the road the truck delivery could have you know you don't want liquid because it's a liquid form inside the tank and it's fed as a gas but uh you know you don't want to make sure that liquid is inside of any of your pigtails and things like that so we'll let them sit for a day and then typically it's you know a few days before we need that to be connected to the system and get put online but um does that answer question Partially. <laughs> Partially? Partially, yes. Thanks, Stacey. Uh, um, like, what are the weak links in the system that you have? <sighs> the weak links in the chlorine system? Well, hopefully none, because that is right. like our main, that is our main, um, there is a lot with that process safety management, there is a lot of um, time spent on, you know, maintenance and checking all of the parts, but. Um, is the weak link in human? The wink link could be could be a human that that maybe there's a there's a lead gasket that gets put in between the tank and the regulators. There's a vacuum regulator system, so the the system is run off of vacuum, so it pulls. But if there was ever a hole, say in your PVC tubing or whatever, 
that loses your vacuum and so the regulator will close and shut so that no gas comes out. Now you would have gas potentially from the valve to wherever the hole is, but that would be pretty minimal and the scrubber would take care of that. Um, the lead washer that sometimes that you put in between your regulator and your tank, you have to get that nice and squished. If someone didn't tighten that down quite tight enough, then potentially you could have a, a leak there. But uh, yeah, I would say once the system's in my time, my, no, oh. no, I was just going to say, I mean, this plant has been run for 44 years and they've never... Yeah, yeah, that is true. Knock on wood again. But, uh, <laughs> but we also have not had a Cascadian zone earthquake. Yeah. Well, I, and I might comment from Portland's standpoint, we currently do use gas, and we're kind of in the same boat. We've been using it for since the 20s, so I guess that's 100 years now uh, without, without incident. But we plan on moving away from the chlorine gas when we move the treatment facilities down to... Uh, down to the to where we're at in East Multnomah County, and there would be we'd be looking at either a solid chemical or a liquid chemical that would be coming in um, to provide the chlorine yeah. And disinfection. Yeah. It's getting harder and harder to get chlorine deliveries since um, there's fewer places that create chlorine gas, and then you know the, having them on the trucks bringing the deliveries is actually considered having them here. Once they get here, they're safe situation but coming in on trucks and you know, some sort of accident on the highway that's considered dangerous so that's that's part of our motivation for moving away from gas as well. Yeah. And the tanks are strapped down with uh, you know big heavy duty straps so hopefully during an earthquake, you know, those things are all screwed down. They're not gonna be bouncing around down there. But but yeah that that definitely a, a concern. So yeah. <clears throat> all right Jeff, go ahead. So here's a shot real quick before, before the expansion began. And then this is a shot we just took the other day after the expansion. You can see we have two more, two more drying beds and we have this whole new system. And there's a lot of other things in there that you probably can't really see from, this, from the big aerial shot, but uh, life safety. So a lot of things were all the lights and the ceilings and the bookshelves and everything that's here was all fastened down and, and strapped up so that if there was a um, earthquake that we would be able to, you know, the, the plant personnel would be able to make it out of this building because again, this building is not on any sort of auger cast piles or anything for seismic earthquaking. So, um, and there was a lot of chemical changes and lines and tanks and pumps and things like that that are just kind of smaller things inside of here. So the majority of it yeah, hard to get a picture of that, but we managed. <laughs> yeah. So here's a picture of the filters um, being constructed, and and you can see it was a it was a massive hole out there um, that we dug up, and and all these filters going in. We have we also built a new surge basin where the backwash from the filters, the backwash water from the filters will go, um, and. Uh, yeah, so that's just kind of showing you what it looked like for the last three years here, I think. Uh, we think we started this in 15. Just How deep are you there in that spot? Say what? How deep are you going there in the ground? Um, so the hole itself was, I think, about 40 feet deep. And then the auger cast piles that we drilled in went down like no, anywhere from 60 to 80 feet oh, deep okay. until it hit bedrock. Um, and then, yeah, they went like, you know, I don't remember, six inches into the rock or something like that. So, but. Like I said, we're very liquefiable soils out here, and and um, flood zone. yeah, flood zone. Go back, Jeff, real quick. Sorry. So these these are the the auger cast piles that I'm talking about. That they go down about 80 feet into the ground, and then the the structure itself is tied to the rebar, so that in case of an earthquake, and if the ground settles 20 20 inches or whatever it is, they're sitting on these concrete pillars that are into the ground, so that the structure itself is not going to drop. Um, it also would keep us from floating, I suppose, if we did um, have that same earthquake and we flooded and, and you know, these are going to hold everything down. So um, this was probably one of the, one of the questions I know we, we uh, probably one of the loudest parts of the construction was when they were drilling this. So you can see this thing here is just a big drill bit that it is drilling down into the ground. And then as they pull it out, they're pumping concrete in as the drills pull it out. So 
It was definitely, if not the loudest, it was it was right up there with one. And gosh, what was there? Eighty two, or more than, more than that? Yeah, maybe eighty two under the filters, and another sixty or something like that under the surge basin. It was so there was a lot of those um, auger cast piles drilled. This was another um, part of the construction where it was pretty loud. And we got a video. I don't know if you guys can hear that. That thing's shaking, but it's it's hammering down this large I-beam into the ground. That whole thing was pushed down into the ground as part of a, um, yeah, shoring for a hole they were digging out there where they connected to our clear well. So that was also um, made some good noise for us. So, um, yeah, so there's, after the hole was in September of 17, the hole was dug and everything. And then this is kind of what it looks like now, the finished product. So. Um, We'll go out there and see all this, so I don't know, but um, permits, I just kind of wanted to, I'm, we won't go through all these, I don't even know what they all are, but there was, there was a lot of permitting that we had to go through for all of the construction work that, you know, we weren't just allowed to go dig wherever we wanted, with, but uh, um, OHA, DEQ, the county, um, yeah, so just a quick kind of cost estimate as to what our expansion cost us. Um, Sladen was our contractor on site that did all the work and Jacobs was the engineering firm that designed everything. So, and then of course our, our kind of time that was put in. So rounded out at about you know, an even 33328508. Project schedule, you know, we began designing and everything else clear back in 2016 and and uh, all the kind of, you know, when prod construction actually started in, in January of 17, we started digging that hole, um, was the first thing that we did. And, uh, um, well, actually, that's not even entirely true. The first thing that we did was work on the life safety and all of those things that are happening inside of this building that, that didn't require construction. And then, and then we moved out. The hole was the first thing that we did that was like real construction, but that didn't begin until um, July of 17. So we, we did that in the summer. Quick question. Yeah. So going back to your to the piles down on the ground, this, that was one of the noisiest parts of the construction. Looking at this timeline, that was only happening for a couple months. It looks like. Yeah, it was yeah. absolutely. It was a uh, not not a yeah yeah. yeah. And, and the reason it took that long is because that uh, that whole facility is below the ground water table. So, so they had to dewater around, so it was really mucky. Otherwise, it would have been dry land. Yeah. It would have been probably only a month in timeline. Where is the 100 foot, 100 year uh, flood stage around here? It's pretty close to you. Yeah, it bellies up to our back of our property out there, um, and maybe even comes onto our property a little bit. But there's only drying beds out there and ponds, so we haven't built anything out there. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we're wrapping up the expansion the project like currently like right now it's getting close but just in time i just wanted to mention i know i mentioned it earlier that the willamette water supply system is another new partnership that hillsborough's involved with with tualatin valley and and city of beaverton and um, tualatin valley is actually the managing agency of of that one um, but we're building a brand new 60 million gallon a day treatment plant um, corolla jude is involved with all of that the design um, Stantec and um, uh, Sunt is the construction con constructor that's working on that. Anyways, um, building a new 60 million gallon a day treatment plant and pipeline to go with it. We'll pull out of the Willamette River in Wilsonville. It'll be pumped from there all the way up to Sherwood where there's a treatment plant and then on up to some reservoirs and then to Hillsborough, to Walton Valley. So we get to we get to do it all over again. This was really good practice for us. That's just kind of a general layout of, of where the treatment plant is um, gonna look like. And again, it'll be a 60 million gallon a day treatment plant, but expandable to um, 120 eventually would be the kind of the max capacity. So um, that's just a quick schedule of that. The construction phase of that treatment plant would be from uh, you know somewhere in 22 and we should be online by by 26 making water, um, hopefully, you know, it'll probably be sometime 25 that we start testing and commissioning and running all of that. So, um, yeah. All right, well, we can also ask, answer questions as we walk through this, but 
I know we uh, it's a lot of lot of ground to cover, so we should get walking, I suppose. <laughs>